power, pulsating speed, performance. These were things you wanted in a sports car, and there was a time when Japan stood high above others when it came to delivering exactly that. At the time, it seemed like Japan could do no wrong with race cars, as it completely dominated the motorsports industry. You know how when you think about anime, you think of Japan? You see Italy and luxury clothes, and remember Australia when you see kangaroos? Sorry, Australians. <laughs> that was exactly how Japan was in the production of the out-of-the-world sports car at the time. And in this era of Japanese motorsports dominance, Mitsubishi was the king, the law, and the truth. Now, don't get it twisted. Mitsubishi's rise to the top was not a walk in the park, especially with the types of competitors it had. When you have Toyota, Honda, Nissan, and even Mazda in their best forms breathing down your neck, you have to come correct. And oh boy, did Mitsubishi come correct. The company revolutionized the business of motorsports production with gallant cars like the Galant Evo Eclipse 3000 GT Stealth and FTO. These cars were not only winning races and rallies, they were redefining culture and creating trends. For instance, we probably would not have the Fast and Furious movie franchise without the Mitsubishi Eclipse. Yes, the dominance was that serious. So basically, at the time, the words Mitsubishi and performance went hand in hand, and everyone thought the company was going to dominate forever. Until it didn't. Mitsubishi one day decided to kill off its lineup of iconic performance and sports cars and replace them with SUVs and crossovers. Crazy decision, right? Strap up and join us as we take you on a ride down memory lane, discussing the iconic lineup of Mitsubishi performance cars and why you will never see them again. We did some digging to find out what was behind the strange decision and rebranding, and what we found was crazy. This is the story of why Mitsubishi will never, ever make a sports car again. Our story started in 1917. Nope, scratch that, 1870, when the company we now know as Mitsubishi was formed. At the time, it was known as Tsukomo Shokai and operated as a shipping company. Do you know who else was around at that time? Henry Ford, the first. He was only seven years old at the time and was definitely not thinking about making cars. Well, to be fair to him, nobody was because cars were not a thing at the time. The name Mitsubishi would come three years later, formed with the Japanese words Mitsu, which means three, and Bishi, which refers to the rhombus shape of the caltrop leaf. And yes, you guessed right, that was where the logo of the company came from, the combination of three rhombus-shaped leaves. The thing is, Japan was starting to look into industrialization like many emerging economies of the world at the time, and Mitsubishi was at the forefront of this change. The company started building its own ships, and by 1917 made the Model A, which was Japan's first production car model. The car was hand-built, which made it expensive and unable to compete with cheaper foreign imports, and production stopped five years later after building 22 units. The company would foray again into vehicle production in 1934 after being commissioned by the Japanese government for a four-wheel drive to be used in the war effort against China. Four prototypes of the vehicle, known as the PX-33, were made, but none was approved, so production stopped again. After a series of breakups, nope, not the type you're thinking, and business mergers, especially after the Second World War, Mitsubishi returned as a whole company in the 60s to the business of automobile production with a single motive, to dominate. With its three-speed Mitsubishi 500 released in 1960, the world was introduced to the start of a history of high-end performance and dominance. The car was small and economical, with the middle class in Japan as the target audience. However, two years later, in a move that foreshadows Mitsubishi's motorsports dominance, the company entered its 500 model into the 1962 Macau Grand Prix and it raced in the under 750cc category, making the top four spots. This was Mitsubishi's way of telling customers that its car might be small and economical, but it is tough. 
It was also a clear message to other Japanese giants like Honda, Toyota, and Nissan that things would not remain the same anymore, and interestingly, they did not. After the success of the Macau Grand Prix, the sales for Mitsubishi 500 ramped up, and it was time to scale. To scale, Mitsubishi married up with an American car company known as Chrysler. See, Chrysler was a giant in the American automobile market at the time, but was getting dunked on by bigger giants like Ford and Chevrolet. So Chrysler kinda needed the marriage, in a two heads are better than one way, and it worked wonders for both parties. But here is an important detail about the partnership that you should note because it will be very vital later in this video. To enact the partnership, Mitsubishi split its automotive division into a separate company known as Mitsubishi Motors and sold 15% of that company to Chrysler. Riding on Chrysler's back, Mitsubishi made its way into the American market, and this was the beginning of its motorsport dominance. The company had just made the Galant, and it was brought into the States by Chrysler under the name Dodge Colt. The Dodge Colt turbocharged Mitsubishi's export sales and worked well for Chrysler as it provided competition for Ford Pinto and the Chevy Vega. As it did with its 500 models, Mitsubishi entered the Galant into rallies to show that it is not only economical, it is also tough and reliable. And this time, the story was different. The Galant won the Australian Southern Cross Rally, which was one of the most demanding and challenging rally races in the world in 1972. Now, not only did the car win in 1972, but it also started a five-year winning streak in the rally, which was totally mind-blowing. Like, no other car could beat the Galant for five freaking years in the rally race. As expected, this bolstered Mitsubishi's ratings in the world of performance cars and motorsports. Building on the success of the Galant, Mitsubishi made another absolute beast in the name of the Lancer 1600 GSR. Now, this is the definition of a performance rally car. The car did so well in rallies all over the world, especially in Africa, that it was known as the king of cars. When we said Mitsubishi was king, we meant it literally. In the difficult and grueling 1976 Safari Rally, this beast took podium positions in all races. Yes, you heard that right. All races. Its influence was so much that Hyundai, the Korean company, had to ditch a purported partnership with Ford and partnership up with Mitsubishi in the early 80s, resulting in the Hyundai Pony, a carbon copy of the Lancer GSR. This is a classic example of a girl leaving a man who proposed to her first for you just because you got the bag. By 1980, Mitsubishi was so big that it was making 1 million units of cars in a year and could no longer depend on Chrysler to import its vehicles into the US. Thus, the company made a decision to enter the US market by itself, but with another name. It partnered with Chrysler again and formed a new market known as the Diamond Star Group. With its factory built in Illinois, Go Wildcats! Mitsubishi kicked off by releasing a triplet of cars, the Eagle Talon, Plymouth Laser, and the Mitsubishi Eclipse. Yes, the very Eclipse that you fell in love with. This is the origin story of the Mitsubishi Eclipse. Before unwrapping the Eclipse and taking you on a nostalgic ride in it, let's clarify something. There is a reason why the three cars were called triplets. It's because they were basically the same cars, under different names. They had the same makeup with the same internal parts, including the insane 4G63T engine that powered the Lancer Evo, more on that later, which was why the cars were known as the Eclipse triplets. Now, the engine was not the only thing that Eclipse shared with the Evo. The Eclipse was also an all-wheel drive like the Evo, which makes the Eclipse a two-door Evo. Insane. This car was so influential that it did not only help set off the two eras in American tuner history, it was found in almost all car racing games at the time. From Need for Speed Underground to Ridge Racer, the Forza games, and Gran Turismo, you name it. The height of its influence came when the Fast and Furious movie came out in 2001, and the late Paul Walker drove the 1995 Eclipse in his very first scene in the movie. 
After the movie, everybody who knew anything about drag racing and their moms wanted to get their hands on this beast. Well, maybe in a different lifetime, because Mitsubishi has stopped the production of these iconic vehicles. With the long, illustrious history of success and dominance with performance and rally cars, we are sure you are wondering why the company made this decision. We did wonder too, and discovered that the reason was to keep up with the current market demands. SUVs are the thing in the market right now, especially in the US. Almost everyone wants a soccer mom, grocery getter type of vehicle, and not that many people are still in love with the gritty, vibrant sports cars that ruled the highways and rallies in the 70s and 80s. Of course, we still do, but you get the point. Other automobile giants are also falling in line with this new trend. For instance, Ford is making plans to focus solely on its crossovers and SUVs, ending other models except the Mustang. So to keep up with market demands, rally and performance cars need to go. But do they really have to go? Ford is keeping its Mustang, Toyota has plans to reintroduce the Supra, while Honda is bringing back its NSX and the Civic Type R. These automobile bigwigs are also making the switch to the SUVs and crossover lane without killing off their iconic sports car lineup. So why is Mitsubishi so different? Well, strap up for another short lesson in economics. Mitsubishi is not as big as it was in the 70s and 80s. Yeah, man lost the sauce already. Today, the company only sells 1.2 million cars a year, which may sound like a lot, but when compared to other competitors, it's not that much. It is safe to say the homeboy lost his crown and can't afford to get involved in multiple car market segments like others. So while Ford, Toyota, and Honda can switch to the SUV lane and still keep an eye on its iconic sports car lineup, Mitsubishi cannot afford to, else another economic crash happens. You may also raise the argument that the iconic rally cars are Mitsubishi's best-selling model, which begs the question, why let them go if they are the best-selling offerings? This is where the story of Mitsubishi's alliance with Chrysler becomes important. Do you remember the important detail that happened at the point of enacting the partnership with Chrysler? Mitsubishi split its motor division and made it into an entirely new company, selling 15% of the new company to their American partners. Now Chrysler has acquired more of the stake in Mitsubishi Motorsports and has lots of say in the focus and direction of the company. Given that Chrysler was never known for performance in race cars, it's not surprising that it's influencing Mitsubishi's new direction to focus on SUVs and crossovers. Most importantly, the motor division is only 9% of Mitsubishi as a company. The company is a conglomerate in its own right, with hands in almost all industries you can think of. From real estate to mining, energy, electronics, and many others, Mitsubishi has its tentacles widespread. So it's no surprise that the company did not bat an eye or worry about us and our love for its iconic lineup of performance cars.